Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. God, I pray that I would just be the first hearer of your word this morning, and I pray, Father God, that the message that you have given me for today, Father God, would, would fall on open minds and open hearts, Father God. I pray, Lord, that where there is any resistance, Father God, that you would just soften hearts today. God, I thank you, I praise you, and I just give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 How's everybody doing this morning? Y'all doing good? Hopefully y'all can still say that at the end. <laughs> can I be honest with you guys today? So normally I come up here and I say something like, if I offend you today, I'm sorry, or it's not my intention to. But so, so God gave me a word today that I think is uh, pretty specific. So I'm just going to say this. I have to unapologetically deliver this word today. Okay, so I'm, I'm probably going to step on toes. I'm, I'm probably going to offend somebody. But at the end of the day, I know for a fact that this is a message that God gave me for today. Given what's going on in our world today, I think this is something that we really need to embrace at the moment. So I just want to start off by talking a little bit. Mike, can you turn me down just a tad? I feel like I'm loud, and as soon as I start shouting, oh no, don't, don't turn me down? Okay, okay, don't turn me down. So, <laughs> People in the back. People in the back. <laughs> so you can you can go ahead and have a seat. You don't have to sit up here the whole time. Okay, I was trying not to cross the cross sheet. Oh no, you're good. <laughs> I just keep seeing something move over here. <laughs> and she's waiting to flank me, take me out from the side. <laughs> so we were we were driving the other day and we were going um, down Harpersville Road in, in Newport News, and there's this tiny little stretch of Harpersville Road that exists between Jefferson and Warwick Boulevard. And Carissa said to me, she goes, how many churches are on this road? Because there's a bunch of churches on that road. And I said, if you think that's bad, you should try driving down Todd's Lane or Big Bethel. So I started looking up some stuff. I started looking up some stuff. You know, in Newport News, there are 142 registered churches. That's just Newport News. In Hampton, there's 167 registered churches. 167. I got to Chesapeake, and I saw that there's 220 registered churches in Chesapeake. I'm like, okay, I can't do this city by city no more because these numbers are getting too high. So look to Hampton Roads, the seven cities of Hampton Roads. 1,594 registered churches in Hampton Roads. Now I gotta be honest with you, I was a little surprised by that. But was he, what was even more surprising to me is 14 of those churches are classified as mega churches that have an average weekly attendance of greater than 2,000 people. Four of those mega churches are on Kempsville Road alone. And in the state of Virginia, there's 8,557 registered churches. So I got to thinking, on Sunday morning, are all 8,557 of those churches delivering the same message. I don't mean the same sermon. I mean the same message. See, because there's, there's preaching and then there's a message. There's a message that goes forth out of this church every single Sunday, regardless of what the sermon says. So are all 8,557 of those churches spreading the same gospel? If Paul were to write a letter to those churches, what would it look like? That got me to thinking even more. If I'm a non-believer, how do I find the right church? And then I got to ask myself, if Jesus came back today, which one would he go to?
So we get back to the original question. Do they all have the same message? Do they all have the same heart? Do they all have the same mind? Are they all coming from one body? And I, I have the answer for you guys, so it's not something that you need to think about. Because of those 8,557 churches, there are approximately 37 different denominations. Now, we use the word denomination as a real fancy term to divide churches into categories, but really the root of denomination is division. I'm going to get in trouble for this message. Just If any other pastors are watching, hey, what's up? Denominations are divisions in the church. Every single denomination, when you do any type of research whatsoever, every single denomination occurred through a disagreement in the house that caused a division because of somebody's interpretation of what they believe the Word of God says. And we've now gotten so far into it that you can register for a church just as yourself, if you've got a couple of people and you want to form your own church because there's something in the Bible that you don't like, you can make your own denomination. You know, probably 15 or 20 years ago, K-Love used to have this commercial on, and I thought it was the funniest commercial in the world. But I'm seeing this commercial being lived out in front of us today, and it was a spoof, satirical commercial for the erasable Bible. Where when you read a scripture you disagree with, you can just erase that one. You know, we all have Bible highlighters, but how many of us in our own lives have adopted biblical erasers to erase those things that we don't necessarily want to do? How does a non-believer find the right church? When I was in high school, I went to church. No one in my family went to church, but I went to church because some old lady at work invited me. And I went to that church, and it was a non-denominational church. Well, I tell you, one thing that that church did was they loved the people that were in that church. See, they preached the gospel through love. So when... When I graduated high school and I went to college, and I thought, okay, I need to find a church. So, aging myself here, I grabbed the yellow pages. <laughs> Some of y'all are like, the what? <laughs> See, before the internet, we had to open a book and turn to the category churches to find out where all the churches were. So... I saw some churches, and I couldn't look them up online. There were no reviews. There was no Google star rating. It was you had to go to the church to see if you liked the church. So me, I was, I, when I say I was a poor college student, I was a poor college student. Like, if I was adding anything to ramen, it was a good day. <laughs> like, like, people talk about, oh, I put eggs in my ramen. You could afford eggs. So I was working full-time, had an apartment, a couple roommates, going to school full-time. You know, I was, I was just making it. So I didn't exactly have the suit and the, the fancy clothes to go to the church. But the first church that I went into, I heard the murmuring almost immediately. But he wore that to church today? See, that was my peace out sign. Because I'm like, if you can't accept me the way that I am, how are you going to accept anybody the way that they are? I want drug dealers to walk through that door. I want prostitutes to walk through that door. I want criminals to walk through that door. Because when they give their lives to Christ, they are going to be just as on fire for him as they were for sin. I don't want mediocre people to come through the door and be mediocre Christians. I want people to come through that door and when they give their lives to Christ, realize that there is a difference. But he wore that to church today? Some of the churches that I visited didn't even preach salvation. Their, their preaching was in line with their biggest givers. Ooh, did I, I, that was out loud, right? I said that out loud? See, I'm fully convinced that if you're in that 10% number, 
Okay, 10% meaning you're a 10% tither and you're also in the top 10% of givers in the church. It is my opinion that if you go to most churches, you can, you can effectively change the entire church's theology within six months. See, because when you tell that pastor something you don't agree with and they quit preaching the word because you don't agree because they want that check, step down. See, but that's how some churches operate. It's who's their top tithers. Can't offend them. Look at Rick Warren. Rick Warren wrote The Purpose Driven Life. Wonderful pastor, wonderful. But when when gay marriage came out and it started becoming legalized everywhere, he goes, well, I need to do a little bit more research into the topic. Really? Who's the big tither in your church, right? Whose, Whose money are you afraid to not be getting now? But a lot of times, those people who are the top givers, not only are they the top givers, but as soon as the church realizes that they're a top giver, they put them into positions of power. They make them elders. They make them deacons. They, they put them into positions where they can effectively direct the theology of the house. Well, I'm here to tell you that only one person should be directing the theology of any house. And that's what God says, what his word says. Okay, I'm going to get to my scripture now but I'm going to be on my soapbox this whole message. So if you would just stand with me for the reading of the word, <laughs> we are coming out of 1 Corinthians 1, starting in verse 10. It says this, I appeal to you, brothers. I plead with you, brothers. I beg you, brothers. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you, my brothers. What I mean is each one of you says, I follow Paul or I follow Apollos or I follow Cephas or I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? You baptized in the name of Paul. I thank God that I baptized none of you except for Crispus and Gaius, so none may say that you were baptized in my name. I did baptize also the Hyphenus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom. Christ be empty of its power. You may be seated. We're going to dig into that just a little bit. How many of y'all have ever read the same scripture a couple hundred times and then one day it punched you in the face? I'm going to tell you the last half of verse 17 hit me. It hit me hard. Lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. If we take a grammatical look at the way this says, basically what it says is, I plead with you to be united or Christ died in vain. When we look at Acts, it wasn't until they were all together in one place that the Holy Spirit fell upon them. When we look through the Bible, unity is a topic that extends not only from the Old Testament, but all the way through the New Testament. Everything is about having unity. And in today's society, we are making up ways to be divided. Every day there's a new thing, a new way to cause division in society. A lot of them are hot-button topics and stuff like that. A lot of it's political. We're in a campaign year now, so everybody's political. There's, I know of people in the past that have gotten divorced and other things over who somebody voted for or what their partner believed. But the thing is, is when we start to sow a single seed of division, That single seed grows and it forms branches. And what it does is it forms a tree of division that spreads out everywhere. 
We need to take all of those things that are going on in society and we're going to say, I will not let that divide me from the unity that God calls me to. Did y'all catch that? I will not let the divisive nature of the world get me out of the unity that God calls me to. Look, we're all different. Every one of us is different. We've got, we've got different heights, weights, races. We've got different backgrounds. Pastor Herman talks all the time about him and I should never be friends. Where I grew up, there were this many black people. Y'all count them? Okay, we shouldn't be friends because I grew up in a racist area, but you know what? He grew up in a racist area too. He shouldn't like me. I shouldn't like him. That man is my brother. I would take a bullet for him. If, he, if, he, if he's in trouble, I'm in trouble. Same thing's true with most of you. You guys are all my brothers and sisters in Christ in this room. If you're in trouble, I'm in trouble. Sabrina, if we need to go get Portsmouth on somebody, we'll go get Portsmouth on somebody. Let's go. Just call me up. Just let me know what I need to bring. We're good to go. But we're family. We are one. In this house, we're one. I think we're pretty unified in this room. But how are we when we leave this room? How are we with our coworkers? I'm not unified with my coworkers. I'm, I'm not alone. <laughs> But God doesn't call us to be unified with those that we get along with. He calls us to be unified. And that, that, that just the thought of lack of unity takes power from the cross, that scares me. Because what that means, especially in today's society, is that division is spreading faster than any gospel we preach. Because in a lot of cases, the church is as divided against itself. So I got to thinking about some math concepts. And I've realized that the church needs to learn how to divide by zero. See, now, some of y'all may not be as nerdy as me, but what, what's one thing we know about dividing by zero? It's not possible. It results in an impractical number. Okay, and if anybody wants the, the mathematical breakdown for why that is, it's because there is no inverse multiplicative of dividing by zero. Okay, so if you want to prove anything in math, you do the reverse. So if you take 3 times 4, you get 12. So if you divide 12 by 3, you get 4. If you divide 12 by 4, you get 3. It is the reverse multiplicative, that big word, of the equation. That doesn't exist for zero because anything times zero is zero. So it results in an impractical number to divide something by zero. If we buy a pizza and we cut it into zero slices, we don't have anything that we can cut. It's zero slices. So it's not possible. But the problem is... The church is so divided that that's a foreign concept. See, and everybody attribute this next scripture to the wrong person, but Luke eleven seventeen says this, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and a divided household falls. Let me read that one again. Luke eleven seventeen, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. So this one scripture gives us two things. So one is a nation. Would you guys say that this nation is somewhat divided right now? I wouldn't say it's somewhat. I'd say we're completely fragmented. But like I said, we keep inventing new ways to be offended. So I'm going to break something down. See, my philosophy is this. 
I think that we should have the ability to recognize differences in every person, people, or culture that comes to the United States. This is supposed to be a melting pot. What makes it a melting pot is the myriad of different cultures that we have coming together. The way that we unite is we recognize and celebrate the differences of each other. Recognize and celebrate. That does not mean when we see somebody celebrating another culture that we call it cultural appropriation. What that's saying is we have a dividing line between what you're allowed to do and what I'm allowed to do because that's not you, that's me. Okay, we have political parties now. There's like, what, like 20-something different political parties? You know, right now, um, what, what's, the, what's the, the Tiger King guy? He's even running for president this year. What's his name, Joe something? What, he was popular during the pandemic, some of y'all may know. <laughs> but even he's running for president. We got so many different political parties, and I'm going to let you know right now that most people will divide themselves on political parties faster than anything else on this planet. But what political party would Jesus be in? See, this is where we as Christians are faced with a problem. And I call it the ambassador problem. See, ambassadors to foreign countries don't pick parties. Doesn't Christ call all of us to be ambassadors for Christ? I'm not saying don't vote. Vote, have fun voting. Be educated about who you vote for. But at the end of the day, should your political affiliation be something that separates you from your brother or sister? Not if you're in Christ. If you're in Christ, there should be nothing, nothing to separate you from the love of God. Nothing should be able to separate your love from your brother or sister in Christ. Nothing. But if you allow a political opinion to do that, you need to check yourself. Remember when I said unapologetic at the beginning? I think we're there. <laughs> Anything that you hold as an opinion, belief, or situation that separates you from other believers is wrong. There's no way to clean up that. When you choose a worldly principle to separate you from other believers, it is that same worldly principle that you have now placed ahead of God. That principle is now who you should pray to because that's the principle you follow. So get rid of that principle from your life. Get back to the principles that are in Christ. I'm going to read another scripture to you, and this is the one that should give you hope. And if this scripture doesn't give you chills, I don't know what activates the chill button. But Ephesians 4, 3 through 6 says this, Eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace, there is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. There is no clearer way to lay this out than that scripture. We should be eager to maintain the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. But oftentimes we are so quick to tear that down. Rather than looking for ways to unite with one another, we look at ways to justify our disagreements. Look, I'm not standing up here perfect. You got, y'all got to understand, I, I don't have this right. Okay? Me, I don't have it right. I don't think anybody has this completely right because we all have people that make us mad for no reason. Like, why he got to breathe like that? Like, you ever notice the way such and such walks? You can tell he got a limp because he's always stepping hard with his left foot. 
We find the smallest things to make us mad about people that we have a fundamental disagreement with rather than trying to find a way to be eager to get back to that unity of the Spirit. Instead of looking at people to try to figure out why we shouldn't get along, we need to look at people and try to figure out why we should love each other. We need to look at each other and say, I love you until you give me a reason not to, and then even after that, I'm still going to love you because that's what God calls me to do. But we've always got people that come in and they want to they they cause the division. Unapologetic, remember that? Remember the few minutes ago? Jude 1.16 says this, These are grumblers malcontents following their own sinful desires they are loud mouth boasters showing favoritism to gain advantage but you must remember beloved the predictions of the apostles of our lord jesus christ they say to you in the last times there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions it is these who cause divisions worldly people devoid of the spirit and i know what some of y'all are thinking well that was that was jude Okay, he was towards the he's he's close to revelations. He may be a little pessimistic at this point. Let's talk about Romans. We know Paul wrote that one. He said in Romans 16, 17, he says, I appeal to you, brothers, to watch out for those who cause divisions and create obstacles contrary to the doctrine that you have been taught. Avoid them. For such persons do not serve our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the hearts of the naive. People that cause division devoid of the spirit. See, that, words like that scare me. Like, just thoughts like, what if God turned his back on me? Those are things that could give me nightmares. What if I could no longer feel God's presence? How would y'all live if you couldn't feel his presence anymore? I'll tell you how I would. On my knees every single day until I felt it again. But when division starts to creep up, we need to address it. We need to address it because that's, you know, we just, we just read what that is. But Titus 3 tells us this. Avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law. Y'all hear that? About the law. Okay? I don't care what's legal and not legal because legal doesn't really... That's not our law. We got our own set of rules, right? Ten Commandments, y'all remember those? Okay. Keep going. (laughs) For they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once, then twice, have nothing more to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful and he is self-condemned. That person that you got at work that is always trying to stir the pot, stay away from that person. When you hang out with somebody that does nothing but try to sow division, if you are the person that stirs the pot, uh, we need to pray for you as soon as we're done here in a few minutes. But (laughs) if you hang out with somebody that is always sowing division, guess what? you're going to start to buy into some of that division. I'm not saying we can't be around saved people. Jesus spent his entire ministry around unsaved people. What I'm saying is we should not give audience to people that are always trying to divide things. When we give those people a voice, the voice gets louder. This scripture is basically telling us, stop it. Because... Scripture, all throughout Scripture, we are described as the body of Christ. And 1 Corinthians also says that the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. 
nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we dispose greater armor, or honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. That's how we tend to think. Well, who, who needs a pinky toe? Did you know if you lost your pinky toe, you'd have a hard time walking because it controls your balance? You'd be falling down all over the place? But God has not composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. God designed our bodies to work in harmony. If one part of your body is out of whack, it can mess up the entire rest of your body. If you, if you even take a look at something as simple as stress, stress has been linked to 27 different diseases. One part of your body being out of whack can affect the rest of your body. <clears throat> if you've ever had a headache that makes your neck hurt, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about because you have, you have something going on in one place. You know, I've had this, this little issue going on with my hip for a little while. Well, every once in a while, the issue with my hip makes my back hurt. Because, see, my body's not in sync with itself right now. I'm trying to get it back in sync. I'm going to have to have may maybe a little procedure unless God touches it. And we'll, we'll see which one of those happens. But I, I believe either one can. I believe that God can either heal me right now or heal me through surgery. But the thing is, is I got something that's out of whack. I need to get it back in line. Just like when you have something that's out of sync in your body that you need to get back in line, the same thing applies to your life. When you got something in your life that is out of whack, that is causing division, you need to get it back in line. See, because Galatians 3.28 says, There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is male, neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ. There are so many things that we could add to that list now. When we say there is neither Jew nor Greek, we could say there is neither Republican or Democrat. There is either, neither pro-life nor pro-choice. There is neither, you know, whatever it is that you agree with that somebody else vehemently disagrees with does not matter. We are all called to be one in Christ Jesus. We need to get rid of division from our lives. We need to get rid of division from our relationships. We need to get rid of division from our churches and our nation. We need to get rid of division anywhere that it exists other than a math class. If we have division in our house, that division is going to spread itself to the church. If we have division within ourselves, that division is going to spread within our families. If we have division within our families, that's going to spread to division in our communities. Division in our communities spreads to our states and our nation and our, our world. Okay, everything starts with me, with you, with everybody. When we start to plant that seed of division, that seed of division is going to grow really, really fast. And it just spreads like wildfire throughout every area of our lives into everything that we're a part of. We've got to stop. There's, there's no easy way to put it. We have to pray. We have to do a lot of self-reflection and figure out what is it that makes me want to be divided from a certain person or a certain people or a certain group. What, what is causing the division in my heart? Once we figure that out and we can start to fix that, then we can start to bring back that unity. And they, again, think back to the beginning of Acts. It was not until they were all together in one place in unity that the Holy Spirit fell upon them. A lot of times we often talk about, well, I can't feel the Holy Spirit anymore. Well, are you divided? Are you acting in unity with your brothers and sisters? Do you sow division? I'm going to conclude with the scripture. I'm not going to belabor this point. I'm not going to drag it out, but I'm going to conclude with the scripture. Bearing with one another... And if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now there's a really positive aspect to this scripture, but it also has a very, very deep underlying theme. If you do not share the love of Christ in unity with people, you will never be in harmony with God.
if we don't make a conscious choice to be unified and strive for unity, then our complacency will only cause division. We cannot create unity and complacency. Would you stand? God is love. The unity that exists in the kingdom should be, notice I said should be, unbreakable. Yet Sunday morning is one of the most divided times in our nation. When I was getting ready for this, I started looking to what other, what a lot of denominations, what their fundamental differences are. And can I just say, they're petty. They're petty differences. Petty differences that divided churches, that formed new organizations off of a difference of opinion. There is one opinion that we cannot find a difference of, and that is God calls us to love. God calls us to love, and he calls us to spread the gospel of Christ. When I said earlier about all the churches in Virginia, 8,557 churches, and I asked if they were all teaching the same message, that question now becomes, no matter where you go to church, are you learning about the love of God, what he did for you, what he did on that cross for you, and to be unified with your believers and follow Christ with everything that you have? That's the gospel that the Bible teaches. When we change that at all, we are not on the right path. So where the scripture tells us to be eager to fall into unity, Philippians 2.2 says, Complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same lie or same love, being in full accord and of one mind. The joy of the Lord is not possible in division. It is only made complete through unity. We're going to do something a little different for the altar call. Rather than having you guys come up here, I want you to go to somebody that you don't know that well and pray with that person for just a few minutes. Say, hey, what can I pray for you about? You pray for them, they pray for you. We'll all come back together and dismiss, but... There's no better way to start to become unified than learning how to pray for your brother and sister. So I'm going to release y'all to do that right now. We'll come back together in a couple minutes and we'll close out. Somebody you don't know well.
Hallelujah, hallelujah. God, we just come before you humbly today, Father God. We ask you, Lord, to touch each and every single one of us, Lord. Help us, Father God, to eliminate the division from our lives, Lord. Help us to find reasons for unity rather than create division, Lord. Help us to come together on one accord with one mind, one body, through you, God. God, you're such an awesome God, and we can't do this without you, Father God. But I pray, Lord, that you would just begin to reveal to each and every single person areas in their life where there is division. And just help us, Father God, to eliminate it all. God, we want to be like you. We want to be united in you, Father God. Even the vision of this church, Father God, says that we will be unified in purpose. And I like to say, Father God, it also means unified on purpose. That it's something deliberate, Father God. And now, God, I pray that you would bless your people. That you would shine your face towards them, Father God. That you would fill them with your grace your mercy and love, that you would be with them as they go throughout their days, be with them as they travel, Father God, and just love on them. God, we honor you. We thank you. And we give you all the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.